Hello, my name is Marissa Cruz, and this is my story. I grew up in Philadelphia. Our parents were always um, going to church, so we were always going also. At that time, being young, you were obligated to go. And when I got to an older age where I can make my own decision, I decided I wasn't gonna go anymore. When I got out of church, I really didn't want to have anything to do with God because I was on my own. But I knew something was missing. I just didn't know what it was back then. And once I started realizing that God was missing in my life, that's when I started seeking Him. The first step when I was trying to get back to church, I, I was just really discouraged. And I had a conversation with uh, my cousin Marilyn about seeking or looking for a church because I knew something was tugging in my heart. And I knew that it was God but I just couldn't find somewhere where I wanted to go. I just couldn't find that church till I was invited to come to Bethel. And when I came, I was like, okay, this is gonna probably be another church that I went to and I'm probably not gonna like it. And it was absolutely great. I didn't feel like I had to pretend to be somebody I wasn't. And that was the great part about everything. changed my life in many ways and one of the best things that he has done for me was finding my husband. I was single for 13 years and I was getting to the point of felt like I was losing my faith with God like God you're not answering me why is it have you forgotten about me and I started fellowship with more Christian women and started reading the Bible more and started realizing that I took my focus off of God and focus on my needs instead of focusing on what I should be giving God. I did a B group. Many of the women that were in the B group were single, as I was at that time. And we were talking about being single and, you know, why isn't God answering our prayers? And I said, stop asking God for a husband and thank Him for who He's bringing into your life. Many of, of us focus on, God, why didn't you answer my prayer? Why can't I find that spouse? Why can't I find that man or woman of my life? Don't focus on asking for something. Focus on having faith with God and telling Him, this is what I'm so grateful that you're going to send me. Because when you do that, God will give you your needs. He will bless you. Stop focusing on everything else and focus on Him and everything will come. Hey, Marisol was encouraging us to choose faith when we're waiting. And that's not an easy thing to do. And we're going we're gonna to sort of piggyback on Marisol's story there about choosing faith when we're waiting um, in our teaching. Before we, we get to that, as the um, containers are being passed for the offering, we like to share stories to encourage you to give God your first and your best. And today what I want to do is I want to share a story about my son and my future daughter-in-law who are getting married this week. So if you could pray for us as a family, that would be awesome. But the story I want to share with you is my son's young. He's just starting out. He's in New York City. And um, I've just been encouraging both my kids to give God your first and your best. They're both part of Hillsong Church up there. And I said, give God your first and your best at Hillsong. And that means giving God your tithe. And it's hard to do when you're just starting out and you're young. And New York's an expensive place to live. And I, I've been encouraging him, and Jordan has been taking steps, intentional steps forward, and it's been neat to see how God's been growing him and stretching him. And here's a cool thing. You know how we talk about God math? When you give God your first and your best, God does stuff that only he can do to make your money go further. And so they were looking for an apartment a few weeks back. They saw one that they absolutely loved. They could afford first month, last month, and a security deposit. But because there was an agent involved, they could not afford the agent fee. So they walked away. 
and they looked at other apartments. They liked other apartments. They put, you know, they wanted to have apartments they saw. Several times they thought they had an apartment. It fell through. And Jordan kept thinking about that first apartment they looked at together. And so he called the agent and explained the situation. And the agent says to Jordan, ever since you and your fiance walked through the apartment, the owner's been talking about you and she would love for you guys to have that apartment. And if the only reason that you can't take the apartment is my broker's fee, then I will make arrangements with you. And what he did was he spread that fee out over several months, and he said to Jordan, we'll start it after the wedding. Who does that, right? So what I'm saying to you is it's God's favor in Jordan's life and Krista's life. Why? Because Jordan is growing and learning how to put God first and best when it comes to giving. You can never outgive God. So keep growing in that area, and God will continue to show up and give you favor in ways that only he can. So I wanted to share that with you, and we appreciate your prayers this week as they get married, which will be cool. Hey, Nightmare Before Christmas, we're talking about fears. Today, specifically, what I want to talk to you about is, do you choose fear or do you choose faith when you're waiting? When you're waiting. Waiting is a hard place. Marisol talked about waiting for 13 years. I don't know how many years you've been waiting. You're waiting for God to do something, and you pray, and you're waiting, and you're waiting, and it's a hard place. We're going to take a look at a story that Jesus shows us what to do in that whole um, place. It's going to be in Luke 8. Open up your Bibles or your Bible apps, or just read with me on the screens. And I want to share three spooky truths with you, keeping with the theme, and I want to share three spooky verses with you that um, are going to teach us as we go through this. So let me start and read this. A man named Jairus, a leader of the local synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading or begging with him to come home with him. His only daughter, who was about 12 years old, was dying. Have you noticed God's timetable is not the same as yours? Have you noticed that yet? Have you noticed that so many times when we're in a rush, God doesn't seem to be in a rush? So here you have a guy whose daughter is about to die. He comes to Jesus and says, please, come with me. My daughter's about to die. Will you heal her? So as Jesus went with him, they're on their way. Here they go. Jesus is surrounded by the crowds. A woman in a crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding, and she could find no cure. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe. Immediately, the bleeding stopped. So Jarius, dad, wants to get home as quickly as possible. Jesus knows that. Remember, Jesus' timetable is not the same as our timetable. Jesus knows there's a rush. Jarius wants to get there fast. So this woman comes behind him and touches his robe. She experiences a miraculous healing. And you would think Jesus would just keep walking, right? I got a place to go. I got something to do. And so we're just going to let this go. Watch what happens. Who touched me, Jesus asks. So Jesus stops. Who touched me? Everyone denied it. And Peter says, Master, this whole crowd is pressing up against you. Have you ever been in an event where there's hundreds of people and everybody's walking together? It's like saying, who touched me? Everybody touched you. That's what they're saying to Jesus. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Someone deliberately touched me for I felt healing power go out for me. You got to think Jarius is saying, Jesus, what are you making a big deal about this for? Why are you making us wait? We have some place to go. Let's keep moving. Do you ever get frustrated with God because what you're asking him to do that's so important to you and you even have a timetable doesn't seem to be nearly as important to God because he's not matching up to your timetable? Here's spooky verse number one, and there's our friend from Nightmare Before Christmas. This is God speaking. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. Nothing. Nothing. God doesn't say my thoughts are something like your thoughts, or my thoughts are similar to your thoughts, or my thoughts are slightly different than your thoughts. My thoughts are nothing, nothing like your thoughts. Nothing. See, if I was God, I would not make Eagles fans wait 52 years to win a Super Bowl. (laughs) Makes perfect sense to me, right? They would have won 52 in a row, right? God's saying, no, 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 my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, Don't say, well, everybody would do this. God's thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. And my ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Why do we think we could figure God out? 
God's telling us, don't try. His timetable is not our timetable. You know, we can choose faith, we can choose fear, we can't choose both. So when you're waiting and you're begging God to do something and he tells you to wait, do you choose fear or do you choose faith? Fear puts you in control and you start trying to control people or manipulate situations and you try to power up over people because you want to bring about your desired result. Faith says to God, I'm going to trust you. I believe your plan for me is good. I believe you're in control, and I'm going to see what you do. Fear or faith? Hey, this week, my wife and I celebrated our 32nd anniversary, and our B group made a Doritos cake. Isn't that awesome? I mean, a Doritos cake. And 32 years we've been married We dated for six plus years before we got married, so almost 40 years together. We started dating when we were six months old, by the way, and so almost 40 years together, and I love her more than anything on this earth, and she's the love of my life, but she is as mysterious to me today as the day I met her. (laughs) Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Tell me someone you've been with for decades hasn't looked at you at some point and said, you don't even know me right? And if we deal with people that way, what makes us think we can figure God out? If I haven't figured my wife out after 40 years, and God says my ways are nothing like yours, they're nothing like your wife's way, nothing. Stop trying to figure God out. God's timetable is not our timetable. And when we're waiting, choose faith instead of fear. Second thing I want you to think about, God wants us to be still in our waiting. So the woman touches Jesus' robe. Jesus says, who touched me? They're like, everybody touched you. And then the woman realized that she could not stay hidden. She began to tremble. The whole crowd heard her explain why she touched him and that she had been immediately healed. Daughter, Jesus said to her, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Jarius is standing there watching all of this. He's the dad. He's a dad who went to Jesus and said, will you come home with me and heal my daughter? They were on their way to Jairus' house, and Jesus is stopping and having this interaction with this woman. You know Jairus is thinking, come on, Jesus, let's go. Let's go, right? We, we got to move. And Jesus is having this conversation with this woman, and Jesus says to the woman, your faith has made you well. Here's what I want you to realize. Whatever area of your life you're waiting in, God's not wasting your time. It's an opportunity to grow and learn, and he wants you to be different because of the time you spent waiting. He's not, he's not squandering your time. He wants you to see what he's doing. He wants you to pay attention to what he's doing all around you in the waiting because there are lessons that we need to learn in the waiting times that are going to give us the ability to move forward. Let me show you what I mean by this. The last, here's what Jesus says, your faith has made you well. Now watch this. Jesus is still speaking. So the last thing he says to the woman is, your faith has made you well. Jesus is still speaking. A messenger arrives from the home of Jairus, that's dad, who tells dad, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling Jesus now. So Jairus just heard Jesus tell the woman, your faith has made you well. Watch. When Jesus heard what happened, he said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just have faith, and she will be healed. Jairus just saw Jesus interact with a woman who was healed miraculously, and Jesus said to the woman, the reason you were healed is because you had faith. And now Jesus turns to dad, Jairus, and says, if you have faith, your daughter will be healed. Jairus was supposed to be there to see what God did through that woman, to see the faith that that woman had, because Jairus needed that encounter, because Jairus needs to have faith for what Jesus is going to do for him. So when you think you're in a waiting period where you think God's just wasting your time, you have to start looking around. 
Who are the people he's bringing into your life? What are the experiences he's letting you go through, positive and negative? What are the lessons that he wants you to learn? Because you need all of that stuff to keep moving forward. He's not squandering your time or wasting your time. He's giving us an opportunity to slow down, to wait, to learn. The verse that I want you to think about is, be still and know that I am God. Why is this spooky? Because we want to be in control when we think God's not doing something fast enough. And God is saying, hands off. Hands off. Be still. One translation says, let go of your concerns. Let them go. See, we can choose fear. We can choose faith. We can't choose both. When you're waiting on God to do something, do you choose fear or do you choose faith? I was talking to a friend of mine last night after the service. He's in his 40s, and he has had drugs and alcohol in his life since he was 12 years old. And he looked at me and he said, Pastor Rob, I want you to know I have 26 months clean and sober. Isn't that awesome? And so I said, hey, congratulations, way to go. It's awesome to see what God's doing in you. And then he said, but Pastor Rob, what I, what I need you to do is I need you to pray for my son because my son has been doing drugs for years. He's on the streets right now. He's come close to dying several times, and he won't listen to anyone. And we've been praying and praying, and nothing's happening. So what do you do? When you're waiting, do you choose fear or do you choose faith? See, fear puts you in control. Fear says you got to get something done. Fear says forget God. I'm going to make something happen. I'm going to force my way and make something to happen. Faith says I'm going to be still. I'm going to pray. I'm going to be diligent, do everything I know to do. But I'm going to let God be the one who does this. Because in faith, I choose to believe that God's plan for me is for good. In faith, I choose to believe that God promised that what he started in my son, he will bring it to completion. See, that's faith. Last thing. I need to surround myself with others who are also choosing faith. Have have you realized how hard it is to live a life of faith out in the world? Anybody else experience that or is it just your pastor realize that? (laughs) Right? We come to church, and by the way, isn't the worship outstanding here? What an amazing blessing we have. You know, and, and we spend time in worship, and you're encouraged through the teaching, and you're in a room with hundreds of people who are choosing faith, and everybody's prioritizing God for this hour, and you leave here, and you're all psyched up, and then you walk out, and you realize there are so many people who aren't even thinking about faith, much less choosing faith. And all of a sudden, everything we talk about in here becomes increasingly challenging to live out there. See, all of us go through that, which is why we need to surround ourselves with people who are choosing faith. You will never experience what God's got for you if you try to go it alone. Never. You need to surround yourself with people who are people of faith, who are encouraging you and cheering you on and saying, you got this. God's in control. God is good. You can trust God. So Jesus is off. He's got a huge crowd around him. He's just been told the girl's dead. Don't bother. When they arrive at the house, Jesus wouldn't let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, James, and the little girl's parents. So out of dozens, maybe even hundreds of people, Jesus, one, two, three, four, five, takes five people in with him. Why? Why not bring the whole mob in? Why not let the whole mob see what he's going to do? See, I'm convinced the reason he takes five people in is because he told the woman that your faith healed you. He told dad back there that if you have faith, your daughter's going to be healed. And the entire journey to the house, he has an opportunity to see clearly who is it that has faith in this crowd? Who is it that really believes? And Jesus knows that Peter, John, James, mom and dad are the five people in the group who really believe. 
who are choosing faith. So he says to those five, let's go. The house was filled with people weeping and wailing, but Jesus said, stop the weeping. She isn't dead. She's only asleep. The crowd laughed at Jesus because they all knew she had died. They saw her dead. They prepared her body. Everybody knows she's dead. And they laugh at Jesus, who is about to do a miracle. Do you know that you have well-meaning people who love you, who are doing life with you, who will discourage you from stepping out in faith? You have well-meaning people who love you, who are doing life with you, who will encourage you over and over and over again to choose fear. Don't step out and try something big for God. Why are you going back to school? You've never been good. You're dumb. Just keep doing what you're doing. Or you say, hey, would you pray for me about this? I feel like God's stirring up this dream that I have. And they're going to say, oh, that's too big for you. Just, just stay, stay where you're at. You know anybody like that? Yeah. Yeah. Those are not faith people. I'm not saying that they're not people of faith. They're living in fear. They're living in fear. And if we don't surround ourselves with people who believe that God is good, who believe that God can do the impossible, who are encouraging us to choose faith, we will never do it on our own. So Jesus walks in and says, hey, wait until you see what I'm going to do. Everybody laughs at him. Jesus took the girl by the hand and said in a loud voice. And again, I always tell you, pay attention to the details the Bible gives us. Why does it say he said in a loud voice? Why doesn't it just say he said? Why, why couldn't Jesus just whisper it to the girl? You know what I think? Jesus sees everybody laughing at him. Jesus says everybody's, you know, everybody says she's dead. Look, Jesus is an idiot. And that PO'd Jesus. <laughs> and so Jesus says, oh, yeah? Watch. And he takes five people into the room, and he shuts the door. And you know the crowd is saying, what is going on in there? And so Jesus, in as loud a voice as he can say, says, my child, get up. And the whole house hears him. And at that moment, her life returned. And she immediately stood up. At that moment, her life returned. She was dead until Jesus beckoned life to come back into her body. God is not bound by our categories of life and death. God is not bound by our categories of time. I need it today. I needed it yesterday. God is not bound by any of that. His ways are higher than our ways. He can do the miraculous. He isn't bound by our laws here on this earth. And whatever is dead in your life that people have told you to give up on, that you've given up on. If you keep choosing the life of faith, you're giving Jesus an opportunity to do the miraculous and breathe life into it again. Don't you dare give up on it. Last spooky verse I want to share with you. Jesus was in a town that had a lot of fear in it, a lot of unbelief. And the Bible gives this commentary. Because of their unbelief, the town... Jesus couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. So what Jesus is saying is, ah, I really didn't do much there. All I did was heal a few people. We think that's the big stuff, right? Woo, God healed me. Or God healed my loved one. You know what Jesus is saying? It's the easy stuff. They didn't believe. They didn't think I could do anything. So I just did a few small things like healing people. Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. Imagine what Jesus would have done there if they believed. Imagine what Jesus would have done there if they chose faith instead of fear. God forbid that we get to heaven and Jesus says to us, see all those miracles over there? They had your name on it. But none of them came about because you chose fear instead of faith. Don't do that. In the waiting, when things aren't going your way, choose faith. Choose to believe that God is good, that God is in control, that his plan is perfect for you, and see what he does. Hey, will you stand with me, please? We're going to pray, and then we'll sing.
one more song. Father, thank you for the reminder today that you are dependable, you are trustworthy. Waiting is a hard thing, Lord. We all have our own timetables, God. We want you to operate within our timetable, but your ways are beyond our ways. Your, your thoughts are nothing like our thoughts, God. Give us the faith we need to trust you. Lord, give us the faith we need to give you the ability to do what only you can do in our lives, Lord. And may we choose in faith to be still and to know that you are God. Thank you that you're so awesome. Thank you that you love to reward those who seek you and those who seek to live by faith, God. May we all experience that in a significant way. And we agree with this parent said, amen. amen.